So at any rate, good evening. Welcome to Bible of Believers Community Church where the name says it all. Amen. And the Bible does say it all. The Bible's in the name. Amen. I'd say you got it wrong, but you got it right. That was close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Pastor Jeff Day here. Welcome. I'm glad you're all here today. And um, we're doing a study on the book of John. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12. We're going to be picking up with verse 22. Been a very, very uh, busy week. It seems like we've been running, running, running. And, um, and I know that it's been a busy week for Frank because, man, that uh, picture he sent me of your guys' is, I mean, I mow an acre and I think I've done a lot and he mowed like 10 acres <laughs> in one day yeah I was so proud it was running good I just couldn't stop <laughs> I can't believe you got that thing you know well I knew the motor was strong on it I knew that I just knew that the deck needed to be rebuilt so we're in John chapter 12 and uh, folks on the internet forgive us for just talking but we're family here and we can do that uh, we're looking at verse 22 John chapter 12 and verse 22, the Bible says, and, and this is, uh, um, they're at the feast and, and the Gentiles had come to Philip and said that in verse 21, they said, sir, we would see Jesus. Uh, that's what they said to Philip. And in verse 22, Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Verily, verily, you know, people, I've had people ask me, what does it mean when it says verily, verily? It's the same thing as saying truly, truly. Um, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will I will my father honor. And uh, that's kind of an interesting thing. If a person serves Jesus, Jesus says, him will my father honor. You know, it's verses like that, and we'll get into this later in our message, I think, but it's verses like that that make the Muslims say there is the Jesus and God the Father aren't the same because... I mean, why didn't Jesus just say, if any man will serve me, I'll honor him. If he was the father, instead of saying, him will my father honor. Amen. We'll talk about that here in a bit. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We, we praise you for it. We, I mean, we would be so, we, we'd be in such, a, we're in a mess already, but we'd be in such a worse mess if we didn't have your word to guide us and to direct us. And so, Lord, we're very thankful for it. We're thankful for our salvation. We're thankful that, that maybe someday we can look forward to the Father honoring us. And, um, God, we pray that you'd help us to see that a little more clearly tonight as we go through this message and as we teach. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd guide us and direct us. Take us the exact direction you want us to go. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So last week we focused on all of our attention on the question, do you love your flesh? And uh, really, we do. I mean, we, we hate it, but we love it. Yeah. We love it because we give in to it all the time, but we hate it because we hate the things that it causes us to do. We hate uh, um, the results of the things that we do that are sinful. We hate those results. Uh, we show that there's a difference between loving yourself and hating yourself or, or loving your flesh. And so um, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.29, no man ever yet hated his own flesh. And there's people that hate our life. I hate my life. I hate the fact that I've, I fall down on my face and there's many times that I disappoint my, my Lord. That part of my life I hate. But boy, I hate... I, 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 the Bible says no man yet has hated his own flesh. I wish we could learn to hate our flesh. It's our flesh that guides us to do things wrong. And at the same time, our text states that if you hate your life in this world, you shall keep it unto life eternal. And so that's not talking about hating yourself. It's not talking about, you know, oh, woe is me, I just hate myself. No, it's talking about hating 
the things that you do wrong in this life that we live, the things where you yield to your flesh. You know, it's something I hate about my life is that I appear, by all appearances, I appear to love my flesh. And uh, I wish I could say I hate my flesh, but I can't. I could, but it wouldn't be accurate because the Bible says no man yet ever hated his flesh. And so you say, well, what about the person that says they hate themselves and they committed suicide? That's an act of their flesh, believe it or not. You know, that what, what, when somebody commits suicide, and I'm not trying to make light of anybody that does that, it's tragic. I've had good friends commit suicide. Brace your heart. It's sad. But, but when somebody commits suicide, um, they don't hate their life. They hate the circumstances that are in their life. Mm -hmm. They don't hate their flesh. They, they hate maybe how their flesh has painted them into a corner. I've known people that were chronic liars, always telling lies. I mean, you could tell they were lying if their lips were moving, they were telling a lie. And I've known people that have had to move to different cities on more than one occasion because all their lies started crashing in on them and it got to where they didn't know what lie they told to who and it's time to move. <laughs> and so that's, that's part of this life that, that, we, that we should hate. And at the same time, our text states that if you hate your life in this world, you shall keep it unto life eternal. It didn't say that if you hate your own flesh, but rather the life. And that's what we talked about last week. Uh, not just this life, but the life in this world. We're going to love our life when we get to glory. Amen. When we get to go be with Jesus, that's just going to be... Um, a celebration bar none. Now, there's going to be this thousand-year period between the tribulation and going off into eternity where Jesus rules and reigns on this earth. And um, Paul talking about that period says to, to do right so that you don't end up naked. There's going to be Christians that for that thousand year period of time are going to be buck naked walking around because they don't have a single reward including even a stitch of clothing. <laughs> And it's going to be a testimony to the fact that they did nothing for Christ. These folks that say, hey, I don't even care if I get a reward. If I just make it to heaven, that'll be enough for me. I can guarantee you at the judgment that won't be enough for you. When, when God reveals to you how you could have served him and how easy it would have been. to, And it is easy to serve him. People think it's so hard. Jesus said, my yoke is light and my burden is easy. It is. The only thing you have to do is get past your flesh that says, don't talk to that person. Don't talk to them. They're going to hate you. They're going to reject you. They're going to... Christians are so weak when it comes to that kind of thing. You know, if we see somebody in the store and the Spirit leads, leads us to go talk to them, and if you're a Christian, that's probably happened to you at some point. Now, you may ignore it. You may not do it. But you just feel compelled to go talk to somebody. And you go and you do it, and it was pretty easy. But Christians are so wimpy. It's like they go to that person, the person says, get away from me. I'm going to hell and I want to go to hell. And the Christian walks away all dejected. And why? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Lord. Amen? Yeah. And I made this analogy before. When you're in a restaurant having breakfast and the waitress comes and says, can I give you another cup of coffee? And you go, no, 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 I'm fine. Does that waitress walk off going, Man, he rejected my coffee. I'm never going to offer anybody coffee again. <laughs> I mean, it's the same type of principle. Just, just do it. So the corruptness of your life um, is what you're supposed to hate. And I believe we're now ready to move on to verse 26. And verse 26 says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. That's, I, I think that's an interesting statement. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. You know, people have a time of it, and God wrote his word in such a way that if you like to have a time of it, <laughs> he's written it in a way that you can definitely have a time of it. And people do have a time of it. What does that mean? What am I mean when I'm saying people have a time? They struggle with things that don't need to be struggled with. They, they, they make a... a as the saying goes, a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah, there you go. As that saying goes, a mountain out of a molehill. Uh, people use verses such as this to argue that Jesus 
is not the Father, yet Jesus is the Father. He is. And, and so you take a, a look at that and says, it says, you know, him will my Father honor. Well, why would Jesus say that if he was the Father? Uh, Jesus isn't just the Father, but Jesus is also the Holy Spirit. The Bible says there's one God. And if Jesus is God, and if the Holy Spirit is God, and the Father is God, and there's only one God, that means those three entities are one God. They're, they're not um, separated. It's, it's like different uh, attributes of God. And so when God came to this earth, it was always God's plan that he was going to come to this earth and become a man. Well, how can he say that? Is he going to say, I was born the God-man? No, he's, he's going to say, I was born the son of the Father. <laughs> right? Doesn't that make sense? That's an easier way for our brains to get it than just for him to say, I'm the God-man. But he was the God-man. He was 100% he was God and he was 100% man. And uh, the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son have to be one because that's the only way the Bible works. There's only one God. And if they aren't the same, then we're wasting our time. If we're following a, a person named Jesus that isn't really God, and we're lost if there's not. But there is a Trinity. That's the whole point. We're not lost. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, if, if, we, um, if the resurrection didn't happen, then our, our faith is vain, and what we're doing is vain. Vain just means empty, nothing. And, and we may as well just pack it up and go home. But the truth of the matter is, the resurrection did take place. And Jesus not only resurrected himself, but he resurrected all kinds of Old Testament saints when he resurrected himself. And, you know, the Bible talks, and, and, and I believe, you know, I'm working on three messages at the same time. I think it's this message where we're going to talk about it. But there were 500 witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. 500, above 500. And so that's pretty good. You know, if you went to a court of law and somebody was accused of murder and one after another, 500 people came and said, I saw him, he did it. It was him. 500 of them, what's the odds of that person being acquitted? And people say, no, nah, he's not guilty. <laughs> 500 people witnessing it. So this whole idea of, of Jesus saying this thing, um, him will my father honor, this is where the Muslims get messed up. They emphatically assert that Jesus is not God, and they use verses like this to prove it. And there's plenty of verses like this, and that's what causes people to have a time of it. They have a time with the Bible. They struggle with it because they can't figure that thing out. And God wrote it that way on purpose. We're going to talk about why God wrote you. Go, why would God make it so muddied up? I'll tell you why. Just give me a second. Give me some time here to, to build it up. <laughs> if there is only one God, and there is, and the Father represents that one God, which he does, then Jesus making statements like, if a man serve me, him will my Father honor, disproves the idea that Jesus and the Father are the same. That's how the Muslims build their brain around it, right? Have you ever seen somebody talk about themselves in the first person? Say you come over and, and you're giving me what's some food that I would like pretty much all foods, but what's a food I don't like? Pineapple. Pineapple. If you came over here with a big juicy pineapple and you said, here Pastor Jeff, uh, and I might say, well Jeff doesn't like pineapple. People say, oh, well, then he's not Jeff because he said Jeff doesn't like pine. You see that? <laughs> he said Jeff, does if he was Jeff, he wouldn't say Jeff doesn't like pineapple. But there's people that talk like that all the time. Um, one of the best Bible schools in this country is out of Pensacola, Florida, and it's not Pensacola Christian College. It's um, PBI, uh, Pensacola Bi Baptist Bible Institute. Bible. And so uh, it's one of the better ones. And they had, and it puts out two types of preachers because it, it doesn't put out businessmen and all that nonsense. You know, did you know that all of our great universities in, in this country start out as Bible schools to train preachers? Princeton, Harvard, Yale, those were all schools that trained preachers. And when they first started, all they trained was preachers. <laughs> now, 
I think there's less than a dozen preachers signed up for any of those schools because they're apostate. People go there for a law degree, for a yeah. degree in business management, for a degree in whatever. But the, they, the, the school at Pensacola, they basically put out two kinds of people. They put out some of the best Bible teachers and preachers that this world has ever seen. <laughs> Or they put out total nutbags. <laughs> that's that's just the way it is. There are people that, that just take things way too far. Um, justify. There's one guy that came out of there that left his wife and used the verse where Jesus said, "Any man that left leaves his father, mother, wife, and kids for my sake will receive tenfold in in heaven." Well, it's not talking about just leaving your wife. It's talking about serving him and your wife doesn't want to go wherever God... Let, let's say that God called me to the Philippines. If God calls me to the Philippines, I'm going. And you say, well, what if Lisa doesn't want to go? Then I guess Lisa doesn't go. <laughs> I'm not going to put a gun to her head and take her hostage with me to the Philippines. But you know, I'm blessed because she'll go wherever I want to go. But that's what it's talking about. Anybody that um, leaves mother, father, wife, children for my sake... Listen, if I have my choice, most of our kids are in the Boise, Idaho area. If I have my choice, that's where our, most of our grandkids are. It's where our great-grandkid is. If I have my choice, I'd be there with all the kids. But I left that because God called me to Alamosa, Colorado. And no matter how much I'd like to be with my family, I'm going to serve the Lord. Um, Lisa and I are pretty sure, we're not 100% sure, but... Because we don't we don't have to, we don't do mystic stuff and we don't have a crystal ball, but we feel very comfortable. But the Lord's going to leave us here for the rest of our lives. That's what we we're going to be taken out of here in a pine box, if you will. And Frank will have to preach my funeral. <laughs> Better get going on it, brother. Right. <laughs> um, but this is where they get it, and we've shown you so many times Scripture that clearly shows that Jesus is the Father, but. You know what? I like to take them to you because repetition drills it into your head. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 1. This is a prophetic verse. Isaiah is prophesying the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah 9 verse 1. The Bible says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. We remember we read that for Galilee of the nations, saying that Philip was the right guy to go to because he was from Galilee of the nations. It was the right person for the Gentiles to go to. Verse 2 the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. So you can see right there some, some tough things has happened to Israel, right? Verse uh, 5, For every battle of, war, of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be the burning and fuel of fire. Now God's going to deliver them. Verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Who's that child, folks? <laughs> It's Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Second advent. When he comes back the second time, he's going to rule this. He's going to be the king of all the world. There'll be a one world government under King Jesus, and he will rule the world according to the Bible with a rod of iron. And so the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Jesus is wonderful, isn't he? Counselor. You can't get any better counsel than from Jesus Christ. Amen. The mighty God. Uh-oh, look at the next one. The everlasting 
Father. Yep. Jesus is the Father. The Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. If you look at those titles, you know that it's talking about Jesus. And it says very clearly that he is the everlasting Father. So this is a prophetic verse announcing the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in verse 6, clearly says that he's going to be called the everlasting Father. They're the same. <laughs> They're the same. So why does God do things like that? Don't you ever wonder that? Why does God kind of muddy the water to where... Why, I mean, the Jews were telling Jesus all the time when he was walking the face of the earth, if you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, he told them over and over again. I'm not sure that he told them real plainly, but he told them over and over again that he was the Messiah. Why does God do... Why can't God just be real plain? Why can't you open up to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and it says, and by the way, Jesus is the Father and He is the Holy Spirit and they three are one. Why, why, can't it, why can't it just make it crystal clear? I'll tell you why. Remember, our ways are not God's ways. And God's ways are not our ways. He, God tells us why He does it that way. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Hebrews back towards the end of the Bible. It's not at the end, but it's kind of in the middle of the New Testament. Hebrews 11, verse 6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's why he talks in riddles. That's why he doesn't make it clear because it's faith that pleases him. He wants you to go beyond what the scholars say, what the gurus say, what Muhammad says. He wants you to go beyond all that nonsense and just say, I believe him. I can't ex can you explain the Trinity? I, I mean, I do the best I can to explain it as part of my job, but I don't think I do a very effective job of because what's my basic argument? Believe me. <laughs> you know what that's saying? Have faith. Because our mind can't fathom that God the Father is up here in heaven, Jesus Christ is here on earth, and yet and the Holy Spirit dwells within every single believer on the face of the earth, <laughs> and yet they're all one. But if you compare Scripture with Scripture, you see things like when Solomon built the temple. He said, God, now I built this temple for you, but the whole universe can't contain you, much less this little temple that I built. God's everywhere. They, they call that attribute omnipresence. He's everywhere all the time. That's how he's going to be able to give an account of your entire life, because he's everywhere all the time. S stop and think about that power because God how many I think that we're pushing 8 billion people on the face of this planet at this point in time 8 billion people and God's reading the thoughts of every one of them at the same time without confusing any of them what a God what a God so without faith it's impossible to please him and why is that it's because um, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him he wants us to come to Him on His terms and simply believe. Believe I am who I say I am. You know, the Jews got it. When they asked Jesus, uh, how can you say that, that Abraham has saw your, seen your day? Abraham died years and years and hundreds of years ago and you're barely 30. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew he was saying he was God. Because what did God tell Abraham? God told Abraham when Abraham said, I'm getting this wrong, it's Moses, not Abraham, right? God, God told Moses uh, in the bush, he said, Moses, um, Moses said, when the people ask me who sent me, what do I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. Tell them that I am has sent thee. So when Jesus said before Abraham was, and it was Abraham that he's talking about, but he was referring to the issue of Moses when he said before Abraham was, I am. He was, he was saying, I'm God. 
He was, and they knew it because they picked up rocks to stone him. Amen. So he wants us to believe despite what all of our senses tell us. Our senses say this can't be. But he's given us little samples throughout the entire universe. You know, everything is done in threes. It starts off with God the Trinity, but everything in this universe is done in threes. Yes. An egg has a shell, a white, and a yolk. It's one egg, but I can take two dishes, and I can put the white in this dish, I can put the yolk in this dish, and I can set the shell over there. It's a picture of the Trinity. Amen? Amen. You know what you got to do if you want a fire? You got to have fuel, you got to have heat, you got to have oxygen. Anytime you put those three things together, you got fire. Anytime you separate them out, you don't have fire anymore. It's done in the threes. The sun gives off three types of rays. It gives off rays that can be seen but not felt. It gives off rays that can be felt but not seen. And it gives off rays that can neither be seen nor felt. You know what that's a picture of? The rays that can't be seen nor felt is God the Father. The rays that can't be seen but can be felt is the Holy Spirit. The rays that can't be felt but can be seen is the Son, Jesus Christ. And so everything's done to point to that trinity of God. Everything in this world is done that way. I preached a message one time, and Lisa says sometimes I uh, overstress a point, but I preached, a, I preached a message one time where I probably spent 35 minutes and I didn't exhaust it going through things that were done in threes. 35 minutes going through this is an example of three. This is an, and why did God give us all those threes? People say, well, it's because God loves three. It's No, it's because he's a trinity and he wants the whole... Jesus said that nature itself testifies of me. <laughs> and so you look at nature and you see the trinity in every place you look. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. We're, we, we have that now. Our, our, if you're lost, your spirit's dead, but you still have it. If you're saved, your body's dead, but you still have it. Amen? And when we get resurrected, we're going to get a new body. And then we're going to have a live soul, a live body, and a live spirit. And we're going to be back in the image of God again. So uh, God wants us to believe despite the fact that all of our senses say it can't be. He takes pleasure in that. He, he, takes, he, he enjoys us taking that kind of commitment. So we're look at Hebrews 11 and verse 1. You're in Hebrews 11. Because uh, Paul says, or this isn't Paul that wrote this, but in verse 6 it says, but without faith it's impossible to please him. You say, well, who wrote it if it wasn't Paul? There, scholars have been arguing about who has written Hebrews for millennium. <laughs> um, I don't think that anybody really knows for sure who wrote Hebrews. Um, if you look at the end of Hebrews, it has a lot of the markings that maybe Paul did write it. But if you look at the beginning of Hebrews, it doesn't line up with any of the Pauline doctrines that he teaches. And so Hebrews is a tribulation book. It doesn't, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's written for the church age, but it's not written to the church age. It's written to the tribulation saying. But look at Hebrews 11 verse 1. It says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I remember, because as a, as a preacher, you read a lot of commentaries from different folks to see what folks think about verses and stuff. And 99% of it you reject because the Holy Spirit tells you that guy, the guy the, a lot of the folks who write commentaries, they're so into their own brain. Um, I was scrolling through something today, not today, yesterday, and I told Lisa, because this guy says, uh, it, was a, it was a message he's preaching, um, what happened? What caused the earthquake when Christ was crucified? Or what happened with the earthquaking when Christ was crucified? I told Lisa, all this guy can do is guess because we don't really know what happened or why it happened or any of that stuff. All the guy can do is guess and he's going to go teaching it like it's fact. Anyway, I was reading a commentary once that said, um, it started off and it was a, he a commentary on the book of Hebrews. And I, when I, and I was going through this whole commentary, but when I got to 11 verse 1, I threw away the guy's book. I didn't even keep the book. I threw it away. 
because what he said was, now Hebrews 11.1 1 is not a definition of faith. Excuse me? Faith is. <laughs> That's a definition. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I'm going to break that down a little bit. Substance. It says faith is the substance. What does substance mean? Well, substance means the essential part or the main or material part. So if it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, it means that faith is the essential part or the material part of the things that we hope for. It's what we're placing our hope in. But it goes on to say that faith, uh, something else about it, it says that it has something to do that's not seen. Uh, and if we want the entire phrase, it actually says the evidence of things not seen. So what does evidence mean? <laughs> because everybody has their own idea of what these things mean. Evidence means that which enables the mind to see truth. That's the definition of evidence. So if we break that down, it's saying that faith is the main ingredient of things hoped for. And it is the, um, it's the thing that enables you to see truth and this is truth that's not seen because it says uh, the evidence of things not seen. And so um, I've had people before say, and this isn't bragging because there's people that are far smarter than me, but it's going to sound, I don't know how to say this without it sounding like I'm bragging, but I've had people that have come to service and they've come up to me afterwards and go, oh my gosh, where did you get all that Bible knowledge? Well, First of all, I don't have it. God gives me whatever I've got. It's not, it's not that I've got a superior brain of any kind. I don't. Um, but it's faith. Because when you have faith and you exercise faith, you know what happens? Faith is like exercising that bicep. See that big old bicep? Faith is like exercising that bicep. If I exercise that bicep, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? If I exercise my faith, it's going to get stronger. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get stronger. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get... And so if it's the evidence of things not seen, I tell this to people all the time. The first time I read my Bible through cover to cover, I probably didn't get anything out of it. <laughs> I probably scratched my head going, man, I didn't understand none of that. But God wants me to read it, so I'm going to read it. The second time I would go through it, probably only about two or three things through the whole Bible. But I come across and go, wow, look, I've never seen this before. Evidence of things not seen. It started with faith. It started with a hope. It started with the main ingredient of hope. And then when I exercise that faith, God says, let me show you something that most people don't see. And then, you know, you keep going through your Bible and keep going through your Bible and God um, keeps showing you things, keeps showing you things. I'm going through my Bible for the 70th time and God's showing me things that I've never seen before. <laughs> you go, wow, 69 times and I didn't get that. That's the way this book is. And it's not that I'm a big guy because I've done it 70 times. I know guys that have done it 200, 200 times, 300 times, so... I'm not saying I'm anything special. I'm not. I'm just trying to get. I'm trying to get you to grasp this concept of faith and how it builds and builds and builds. Uh, people say, preacher, would you pray that I could get more faith? Well, I'll pray, but get your nose in the Bible and read <laughs> and exercise your faith. You know, Paul says, work out your salvation. You know, he's not talking about salvation as a process. What he's saying is, you're already saved, but maybe you're not living to where people would even know you're saved. Work it out. <laughs> Take, like going to the gym. Work out your salvation. Let people see that you're saved. Let people see the difference in your life. As soon as somebody knows you're a Christian, boy, they watch you. They do. They put their eyes on you. And they're wanting to know, does he have something different than I have? Or is this thing a farce? I've heard about Christians. You know, I, going door to door all the time. You know, I, keep, I tell you things that you comment. I've gone door to door so many times. The person answers the door. You start dealing with them. They go, oh, I, I won't go to church. Why not? Well, there's too many hypocrites in the church. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I always respond to them? 
We got room for one more. Come on. Because everybody's a hypocrite. Everybody is a hypocrite. There are hypocrites in the church. For those who want to deny it, you're, you're crazy. You know what? We're all hypocrites. I have a standard that I know God wants me to live by, but I don't fulfill that standard 100% of the time. That makes me a hypocrite. <laughs> but if being, if being that a church has, you know what? You, you don't have any problem going to the ball game with hypocrites. You know, you don't have any problem going to the movies with hypocrites. You don't even have a problem going to the bar with hypocrites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got room for more hypocrites here in the church. Come on. Come on out. We can compare notes on how hypo hypocritical we are. <laughs> Amen? So, um, evidence, that which enables the mind to see truth. So, the verse is saying that faith is that which enables the mind to see truth that is not seen. First time I went through it, I didn't see it. The truth was there. I didn't see it. Does, is, this, is this making sense? Is it, are you getting an idea maybe? So God writes his word in a way that you won't see things because if you could see it all, there'd be no faith involved in it. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. Okay. And so he wants you to make a step out in faith. He wants you to behave based on faith, not based on what you can see. There's a contemporary Christian song, and I always talk about it because it's so stupid. The lyrics to the song say, I'll have faith even when I can't see. Well, you moron, if you could see, it wouldn't be faith. <laughs> the only time you're going to have faith is when you can't see. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Lord tells you to go do something and you're afraid. I, I, he's told me to do things that I was afraid. You know, somebody shows up on the door, they look rough as a cob, and it happens. Could you give me a ride down to Deer Valley? <laughs> sure. And as I'm leaving, I tell Lisa, pray that this guy doesn't pull out a gun or something to take the truck. Mm -hmm. And I run them to Deer Valley, and they get preached to the whole time. I find a story about somebody, uh, a preacher friend of mine, um, he picked up a hitchhiker out it was pitch dark it was late at night he was getting tired he said maybe if I pick up this hitchhiker I'll have somebody to talk to and I won't have to worry about falling asleep so he pulls over he picks up this hitchhiker and this hitchhiker climbs in the truck and they drive for about a mile in silence now this is a preacher that picked him up so the preacher driving down the road he says uh, if you were to die right now do you know where you'd spend eternity and this guy who didn't know the preacher didn't even know he was a preacher he backs up tight against the door. He goes, no, mister, please. He thought the preacher was going to kill him. The preacher was like, preacher like, no, 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 no. You misunderstood. I'm a preacher. I'm trying to get you to think about eternity. <laughs> but he thought he got picked up by a serial killer. So God writes his word in a way that you won't see things because by not seeing them, you exercise faith. And it's that faith that pleases him. And we should, we should look forward to being able to step out where we can't see. If we're waiting to see the path, Lisa and I moved to Alamosa not even knowing what Alamosa looked like. Never been this far south in Colorado, I don't think. We've been farther south in the States, but um, I mean, we lived in Arizona for years, but we've never been this far south in Colorado but the Lord said go to Alamosa and so that's a step out in faith now going along with our series that we've been teaching on the boxes we build when you see two words serve and honor our mind goes to what we think those words mean because our text says those who serve me, him, my father, will honor. Amen? And so when we hear serve him, to some folks that means, yeah, I go to church once in a while. You know, the Sunday, I call them S, uh, the C&E Christians. The Christians that go to church on Christmas and Easter. And I don't cater to them. You know what? Churches cater to that crowd. I don't cater to them at all. 
Um, I, as a matter of fact, I, and, and this is my flesh, but I don't have much respect for him. Jesus hung on a cross, dropped every drop of blood he has to save your wretched soul, and you think you're serving him well by going to church two times a year? Got to shake your head about that one. Yeah. Amen? And, and should we give you a, a... Most churches give out gifts to folks on Christmas and Easter, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to give you a prize because that's how you honor your Savior. Uh, not me. <laughs> I'm not giving you no prize. Um, you know what kind of messages I preach on Christmas and Easter? <laughs> Hellfire and brimstone. Mm -hmm. People might come here that have never really heard the truth. And they're going to hear the truth. And they may leave here and say, I'm never going back to that church again. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says if you're a watchman and you give the warning, the blood's not on your hands. Yes. If you're a watchman and you don't give the warning, the blood is on your hands. Mm -hmm. That's why, uh, you know, my, my mom, her pastor in, in um, Portland, she is talking about how much she loves my preaching, which she would, you know, it's her pastor. <laughs> Probably not the right thing to Hey, my, my son's such a better preacher than you. <laughs> but you know how parents are. They love their kids, right? So he listened to some of my messages. And, you know, I go through the plan of salvation. You know, pretty much 90% of the messages, I'll at least give a blurb about the plan of salvation. And he goes to my mom and he says, Well, you know, I don't think a preacher needs to talk about how to get saved every single message. Really? I don't know who's listening. I know who's in this room. I believe everybody in this room is saved. I believe everybody in this room is born again. Amen. But there's people that are turning, in, turn, turning into this ministry for the first time. Um, and God does some weird things. You know, there's somebody turns into a message for the first time and they were going to kill themselves that night. And they hear a message and get saved instead. It's not a biblical concept that God works in mysterious ways, but you know what? God works in mysterious ways. Lisa and I were sitting in a conference where Sam Gipp was preaching, and Sam Gipp, boy, he's a he's a very good preacher. He he'll convict you, he'll get your brain cranking and thinking about things. And Sam Gipp's sitting there preaching away, and he's like in the middle of a point, and he just stops. He goes, "Sir." And I don't even know who you are, but what you're thinking about doing, don't do it. And he went right back on to his message. That was the Holy Spirit leading him about somebody that was listening that was going to do something that God didn't want him doing. I mean, that had nothing to do with the message he was preaching. But it showed that the Holy Spirit was there and working that night. You say, well, I don't know that I believe in all that. Well, I do. So when we hear the word serve and we hear the word honor, we think of things that we, our brain goes to what we think serving and honor is. You know, Billy Graham, uh, this always gets me in trouble because I'm kicking an American God here. Everybody thinks Billy Graham was such a great man of God. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to say he wasn't. That he, I, I'm not going to judge my master's other servant he can judge his other servant but Billy Graham wrote an autobiography that was entitled in his own country and among his own kid and it was talk kin and it was talking about the honor and glory that God had bestowed upon him that's not what this is talking about at all God's not talking about Billy Graham and the things that Billy Graham has seen um, I've had people ask me how many souls have you led to Christ and I say, count them today? And they say, yeah, count them today. I say, I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. I have no clue. You know why? Because number one, I don't know how many people that I dealt with out of the Bible that made a profession of faith that they didn't really mean it and they didn't get saved. By the same token, I don't know how many people that I've dealt with from the Bible and showed them how to be saved that they rejected it totally and then sometime later said, that preacher made sense and calls upon the name of the Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. <laughs> I have no idea how many people I've led to Christ. None. Not a clue. And folks that say that they do know are at best naive. Mm 
I'm not going to say that they're liars, but at best, they're naive. Uh, Lisa and I were going to a church in Arizona that um, we went to the morning service, and it was a long ways away. From, it wasn't uncommon for me and Lisa to drive an hour and a half to two hours to go to a good church one way. And so we, they were do, doing, uh, they were going out soul winning between the morning service and the evening service because a lot of churches have a morning service and an evening service. We didn't go out door to door with them. We went home to take care of dogs. And then we came back for the evening service. And um, when we got back to the evening service, he said, how many people led somebody to Christ today? And pretty much everybody's hand went up in the, in the room. And I'm looking around going, man, we're in a time when people aren't coming to Christ. And everybody today led somebody to Christ? And he goes, uh, th this is like five weeks in a row that everybody did it. And I'm looking around, there's like 10 people in this church. I'm going like, if every week 10 people are leading 10 people to Christ, where are all these people? <laughs> where are these people that are coming to know Christ? A, a dear woman who I really believe is saved, she gave me a video from Hiles Anderson uh, University, um, a, a video about how to be a soul winner. And they were interviewing people from the church. And I got to laugh at him. And he goes, what's so funny? I said, watch this. And came in and I plugged it in because I don't think she was sitting watching with me when I first sat down to watch it. And I said, pay attention. Because there was nobody that had an odd number. There was nobody that said, I've led seven people to Christ. Nobody said, I, I led 39 people. To it was all even. I've led 65 people to Christ. It was either in fives or tens. <laughs> Everybody. I've led 60 people to Christ. I've led... 85 people to Christ. <laughs> How come nobody did 87? How come nobody... The reality is you don't know who you led to Christ and who you didn't. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I know for sure happened at Hiles Anderson, uh, um, uh, the church in Hammond, Indiana, they have huge bus ministries. They probably had 40 buses that would go into Chicago and pick up snot-nosed ghetto kids and bring them to church. They wouldn't let them go in where the main service was, where the main members were. They had a separate building for all these snotty-nosed ghetto kids, which I disagree with. But they'd offer them a great big candy bar if they came to know Christ. Some of those kids got saved every single Sunday to get their candy bar. And they'd count them because they were focused on counting. I think that's been the downfall of church, counting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God says he'll provide the increase. Mm -hmm. And somebody says, well, you only say that because you don't have big numbers. Eh, whatever. Good preacher friend, well, he wasn't a friend, but a good preacher that I know of used to say, ah, your father's mustache. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> ah, your father's mustache. I think it's an Irish term. But... Your father's mustache. So it's not talking about that kind of honor. And many people of God, uh, God that does honor, actually perish in misery and in poverty and in pain. The people that God truly honors. Look at Wormbrand, uh, tortured for Christ. God loved that man. I mean, I've told this story over and over again because I absolutely love it. He's in prison for his testimony to Christ. They beat him every time they hear him talk. And he'll, even after a beating, he'll tell the guard to just beat him. I'm praying for your soul. Mm -hmm. And so he's having a little Bible study in his jail cell and the guards just bust in the, the jail cell grab him, drag him off, and as they're dragging him off, we told you not to speak in this name, and they drag him and they beat him to a bloody pulp. They broke the bones in his feet, they'd hang him, they'd hang him by his feet and take a stick and just beat the bottoms of his feet with a stick. And he couldn't walk. And then they'd come and they'd throw him down at the door and say, get in there. And he'd just, he'd have to crawl and kind of drag himself, and he'd drag himself back to where he was sitting and get back up in his chair and go, now where was I? He's going to pick right up where he left off. God is, God's going to honor that guy. And look at the pain that he went through and the suffering that he went through. You're in Hebrews 11. Drop down to verse, um, 
I turned away from it. I've got to turn back. Uh, go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and look down to verse 36. Hebrews 11, 36. And I've preached off of this text a number of times, and Lisa can tell you, I can hardly preach this without getting a lump in my throat and starting to cry. But it says, it's talking about, um, well, let's go up to, 32. First of all, this chapter is considered the chapter of faith that goes through people that did things out of faith. And then you and it goes through a whole list of them. And then you get to verse 32 and it says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to talk of tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned, the flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So God's going to honor those guys. And in this earth you'd say, what advantage is there to Christianity? We, we need to get our head around this because the time's coming, even here in America, where Christians are going to suffer persecution. They're suffering persecution all over the world right now. Every year for the last 10 years, the number of Christians who have been murdered for their faith has gone up substantially every single year throughout the world. And if you think America's going to stay clear of all that, God would have to apologize to every other nation. You say, well, America's more righteous than those nations. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Maybe at one time we were, but not now. Gay pride. Let's take pride in our sin. Those people are going to be honored. And that's what God's talking about. This number of people also included the Apostle Paul. Paul was considered the Oscaring of this world. What is recorded of his life would never remind you of anyone getting honor from anyone, let alone God. The Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And, and you wouldn't think that he's getting honor. You want to see Paul's honor? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24. Want to see Paul's honor? 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians 11 verse 24. This is Paul talking. He says, of Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. You know, in the law, you couldn't beat somebody beyond 40 stripes. And Paul said, five times. They hit me 39 times. <laughs> they wouldn't violate their law. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have spent the deep in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, 
in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the, all the churches. Does that sound like he's being honored? The world's not going to honor you. It didn't say that you're going to get honor from the world. No. Now, some of these big preachers, they got honor from the world. I don't really want that. I don't want it. And the reason I don't want it is because God says, you get your honor on earth, you get your reward on earth, you got your reward. Don't give me my reward on earth. I want my treasures in heaven. Paul got his treasures in heaven. Paul said, I run this race that I may obtain. When we read the word honor, I seriously doubt that is what came to your mind. <laughs> Getting beaten constantly, being thrown in jail, being in shipwreck, being stoned. Hmm. I don't think that's what you had in mind. Do you think that's what the text that we read in John 12, 26 is talking about when it says, Him God will honor? It's what we, I think God loved Paul. <laughs> Amen. It certainly isn't an easy read, but if you want to look at God's honor, get Fox's Book of Martyrs. I mean, if you can read that without sharing tears, your, your, your heart's harder than mine is. Seeing how great saints in history would have been tortured and killed by the Catholic Church. That's what that book's all about. There's, there appears to be a huge difference between man's honor and God's honor. Yeah. Seems to be a huge difference. Who do you think is right? Mm -hmm. okay. You know, the, the Bible says our ways are not his ways and his ways are not our ways. It shouldn't surprise us that there's a huge difference between what the world would see as honor and what God sees as honor. You know what Paul tells you to do when you get into persecution and, and things aren't going right, when you get jailed wrongfully, when you get accused wrongfully, when you get persecuted and, and it's because of your Christian faith. You know what Paul says? Rejoice! Because God counted you worthy. Amen. Yeah. And that's where we have to have our mindset because if things get bad in this country, We need to get together as a little colony and survive in the wilderness because they'll take our homes from us. So they'll take, uh, I mean, you say, do you think that's possible? Do you know that they have a rating system right now? It's kind of like the credit system, but it's based on where you spend your money, et cetera. Do you, you know there's a reason why they want to push you to debit cards, and it isn't because cash causes illness. <laughs> It's because they can track everything you do with the debit card. They know exactly, they know more about you than you know about you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're rating you based on what organizations you support. They're rating you based on whether you, you say, why would Target go out in favor of a satanic designer and in favor of the LGP WXYZ group mm -hmm. and lose billions of dollars? because it's a long-term investment. They already know that that rating's being done. Yeah. And they already know that, yeah, we're gonna suffer loss right now, but the ones that turn against these agencies, these devil, de this devilman, the ones that turn against it, they're gonna go out of business. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is survive this little bump in the road and then we're gonna be blessed by Satan. Mm -hmm. Amen. We don't understand because our ways are not God's ways. The modern Christian movement that teaches you get your reward here on earth, you know, the prosperity preachers, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, give me a little bit of money and God's going to bring it back to you, press down, shake it together. I have a type of personality, if I wanted to be one of those guys, I could. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. I'm serious. There was a point in time when I was a used car salesman and man, I sold cars. I sold cars. I have the type of personality that, first of all, I'd have to get a big crowd. How do I get that? I just gotta hire a good rock man. If I get a rock, good rock man, people will come. I, I, I'm serious. If they don't come for preaching, they come for the rock man. Right. I get a good rock man, people will come. 
When people come, I can preach them in a way that they will give me their money. But man, I'd be sacrificing so much. Let me be in poverty here on this earth. Let me have a broken heart over the fact that nobody cares about true Bible-believing stuff. And it does break my heart. But I believe I'm building rewards in heaven. We aren't through with this yet, but we're certainly out of time. Um, you know, if, if you look back at Job's life, you'd have to conclude that he wasn't serving God if you take the idea of these prosperity preachers. Uh, you'd have to take either the position that he wasn't serving God or you'd have to conclude that Job's buddies were right and he was wrong. And yet God said, when his buddies got done talking, who's this that darkens the count with the counsel of ungodliness? His, his buddies were wrong. He was the one going through it, but he was the one that was right. And God's honoring him. You say, I don't understand that. Neither do I. Neither do I. But we're going to pick up and we're going to talk some more about this next week. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word. And I just pray, Lord, that our hearts will be ready. I don't know what the future holds, and maybe we will squeak by without a lot of persecution prior to our rapture. Maybe we will. Maybe America did enough historically that you're going to just show mercy here in America. But Lord, if you choose to let America reap what they're sowing, we might have some serious, difficult roads to hoe. And we pray that you'd give us a mindset that we could handle it. We pray that you'd help us to glorify you through all of it and that we would not turn away from you for whatever reason. We praise you for all you do for us. We do love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.